Uh, thank you, Nathan. Um, okay, so I do research in advertising, and uh, when I go to party dinner parties and our standing parties, um, I talk about the technologies that I use, eye tracking, face tracking, I'll explain what that is. And then after a while, people ask me, so do Super Bowl ads really work? <laughs> uh, and, you know, and then I do this speech that I think some do, I, I think some don't. Uh, but when you look at the literature, there's quite a few papers on Super Bowl advertising, mostly say they don't work. And I say, that can't possibly be true, right? There's so many big companies that have been doing it for a while. It depends on how you do it. So, so this is a little bit broader research because I thought, I don't want to write another uh, paper on Super Bowl advertising. I, I thought about it. The issue is really, does entertainment in advertising really work? And if so, under which conditions does it work better or worse? So the title of the talk is Why, When, and How Much Does Entertainment Work in um, uh, Entertaining Consumers in Advertisements? Uh, I'm going to only focus on video, online video and TV commercials. Uh, and then subtitle a web-based facial tracking um, a field study in which I'll, I'll use the data and I'll explain what that is. So it's joint collaboration with um, Rosalind Picard from MIT Media Lab and uh, Rana El Kaliubi, uh, co-founder of Affectiva. It's the same company that Stan showed you the video yesterday on uh, facial expression analysis. And I'll show you a bit more about that. So before I go into this talk, I want to just tell you briefly how I think about advertising effectiveness. And I've done quite a few papers in this area. And the simplest way that I could talk to my mother about advertising is the following. There's ad content whichever that might be. It needs to attract people's attention because if it doesn't, people most of the time aren't forced to watch the advertisement. So if you don't attract people's attention, then you can't go into the real good stuff, which is after you get people's attention, you persuade them somehow. You change their attitudes, you change their behaviors, you try to get them to share the ad, try to get them to buy the product, consider the product, so on and so forth. So I've done lots of research um, in this process for example, using humor to get attention for online viral ads such that you can get people to share the ads. Using branding such that you can get attention, such that you can get people not to skip ads while um, using DVRs. Um, one of the main kind of broad findings is that, um, first of all, you, when you look at the data of, um, I, and I collected this data across papers and across research studies from the 80s to about today, and you look at the percentage of people that avoid watching TV ads, that don't watch TV ads in their entirety. And then in the 80s, they looked at how many people are switching the channel, and then you have about 10%. And then when you say, well, people, some people just leave the TV on, and so that doesn't capture the whole extent of it. You need to watch it and be in the room. And so Nielsen got this data, this data which showed that that goes up around 40% of people avoid watching ads at some point in time. They don't watch the, ad, the TV ad completely, but while well, people have to be looking at the TV as well as being in the room, they can't be talking to their friends. So when you add that data, you start looking at 55 to 60 percent. And then uh, um, when you add, say, well, do people even remember anything vaguely remotely about uh, an ad a week later? And then you're at around 80 percent of people have no recollection, have no attention for TV advertisements. And sort of this is more or less, I think, the data is north of that. Uh, uh, today, with people have much more control over advertising content that they get exposure to. So if you do studies in which you force people to watch ads, basically you eliminate a very important part, which is how to get people's attention. Uh, the takeaway that I get from the research when I put it all together is that for the first part, the first step, you need to focus on the consumer. The company that goes to the ad agency says, I need a great ad, the ad agency says to say, Forget about your interests for a moment, company. I'm going to focus on the interests of the consumer because if they don't get attention, you are out of the picture. So first you have to focus on the consumer. After you get their attention, you can be sort of advertise focused or brand focused. Now, what, what's in it for me? What's in it for Coca-Cola to do advertisements? How can they have an impact? So that's the broad issue uh, um, of my research. And I'm going to talk today about uh, a few elements within this framework. First of all, I'm going to talk about how to use entertainment effectively in TV and online advertising. I'm going to talk about how to do branding. Basically, essentially, how do you put your brand within a TV commercial in TV and online video ads? And I'm going to talk about a little bit of the benefits of facial tracking, which is the technology that I'm using currently relative to other technologies. So if you're not remotely interested in any of these things, you might have a break or have something to eat because I have nothing to offer beyond this. 
okay, so most of you are staying. <laughs> I was afraid that you know, half of you might leave, but I said, you know, let, let's take a shot at it. So motivation for this paper. Uh, um, David Ogilvie is one of the famous key personalities in advertising. He created the ad agency Ogilvie and Matter, now it's Ogilvie, part of WPP, and he said in a book, 1963, good copywriters have always resisted the temptation to entertain. The purpose of a commercial is not to entertain the viewer, but to sell to him. So basically he's saying you don't entertain, you provide information, you provide whatever it takes to get people to be convinced. But then uh, um, he wrote another very influential book, Ogilvie on Advertising in 85, and he says, uh, the latest wave of factor analysis reveals that entertaining with humor, for example, can now sell. So he's like not completely convinced, but he says it works. So that's kind of like the motivation. There seems to be a balance, right, uh, to achieve in that. So the first question is, why entertain consumers at all in TV advertisements, or why entertain so much? So just to give you a sense of how much money spent on pure entertainment, Pepsi spent almost um, half a billion dollars on TV advertising in the U.S. in 2011. Out of this, about $275 million were spent on entertainment content that had no direct association with a brand, no link, no mention of products or benefits, so on and so forth. When you look at Pepsi, they have a huge incentive to get entertainment right. They spend a lot of money on it, and if you look at the, the price and then the cost of a can of Pepsi, I look at the price at Amazon is about 67 cents per can. When you boil that down in the direct costs, 13, 13 cents out of 67 cents goes into just getting that can from the distributor to the end consumer. Seven cents is on advertising, uh, uh, four cents is on the aluminum, and about one cent on the liquid, on, uh, on the sugar, the water, and the syrup. <laughs> so when you buy a can of soda, you're actually buying advertising in a can, nothing else. The liquid is just sort of like a byproduct. <laughs> so they have a lot of incentive. Let me define entertainment going forward. Basically, you can distinguish between content and ads as entertainment, as information. Um, the literature says entertainment is actually entertaining content, warm, playful material that makes the ad pleasant to watch, lively, amusing, imaginative, or clever examples. Humor, creativity, Im imagery, um, creative stories, upbeat music, and fun versus features of products of the brands and the benefits um, um, that these features provide. So in my study, I have lots of these types of entertainment. Um, so for example, humor in Mountain Dew ad, um, imagery, sort of like you know, this video of Cadbury with these fish fighting with each other, dancing, music, fun, uh, um, animation, and a creative story. So think about that. And I'm not going to talk about the type of entertainment that is best. I'm going to just brush this issue out of the question and talk about other factors, and I'll come back to it and explain why. So how do I measure entertainment in these ads? Uh, well, basically with, uh, with face tracking technology, I have a paper published and I'm working on other papers using the technology. It allows me to film people's faces, make sure that I know where their face is in the image. So if they move, they turn around, they go upside down, I can track their face. And then from their face, I can measure deviations of their facial expression. So if they, they smile, sort of, you know, uh, the, the mouth widens, the distance between the corner of the mouth and the eyes decreases. So all these measures I capture, and then there's an algorithm that allows me to say, what is the probability of this person feeling joy? And I'm going to associate the amount of entertainment in the ad with people's individual um, reactions to this entertainment. Meaning, do they smile? Do they laugh? Do they grin? And uh, I'll capture this intensity as well. Uh, and so the benefits are, it's, not, it's unobtrusive, nothing touches the person's face. They can do whatever they want, they can watch as they would. It's moment by moment, I get this data 14 times per second. No cognitive efforts, they don't have, need to turn a dial, they don't need to do anything. Just watch that as they would. And it's important, it returns to a zero baseline. Meaning that whenever they're not entertained, they go back to, my measure goes back to being zero. Meaning just a non-expressive face. And if you think about it, it's very, very hard to keep smiling. Try to keep smiling for a while. It actually hurts. So <laughs> that's important to know. So um, let me give you an example of, of the type of uh, um, data that I had. This is a participant watching a Carl's Jr. ad. Up top, you'll see on the bar charts, you'll see all sorts of measures of emotion. The top one is neutral. There's happy, sad, angry, disgusted, surprised, and fear. And then to the right, you're going to see a moving window of neutral, which is the top line and then disgust, which is the bottom line, and let's see the association that this person has with this content. Look at the graph moving in response to her image. I'm seriously going to throw up. Oh, okay. 
Look at again how it spikes the graph. So uh, uh, not not too entertaining, right? Um, Interesting enough, if you show this ad to some you know, young uh, uh, males, they just laugh uncontrollably. <laughs> so, you know, gender still matters. Um, so the, the second question that I want to try to answer is uh, uh, when to entertain consumers during TV ads. Um, basically, uh, there's a paper, very good paper, that talks about the association transfer hypothesis. And this is pure conditioning. And it basically says that if you want to use the process of conditioning, the Pavlovian process of associating, let's say, a brand Pepsi with fun, what you have to do first is say Pepsi, then fun. Pepsi, show fun images. Pepsi, show very entertaining and fun and creative images. And then people say, well, Pepsi's fun brand. If you do the other way around, it doesn't work as well. And the reason is because our brains don't work that way. If you think about a noun, a person, a place, versus an adjective, fun, entertaining, creative, exciting, cool, the noun is like a folder. And the adjectives are like papers in the folder. So for me to associate fun, entertaining, creative with Pepsi, I need to have a folder to know where to place it on. So first you tell me what it is. What, is this Coke? Is this Pepsi Mountain Dew? If I don't know, I don't know where to put these papers. And so uh, uh, um, the brand is kind of the label in the folder. And so you have to brand first and then entertain to benefit from this association transfer. The problem is many ads have the brand only at the end. About 25% of the, 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 the ads in my prior studies show the brand only at the end, and there's a problem for this associated transfer hypothesis. So I ask the question, I'll say, when to entertain? Is it only after the brand, or are there benefits to entertaining before the brand? Before the brand appears. Brand, meaning logo, the trademark, the pack shot um, in the ad. And then the third question is, how much to entertain consumers, right? Uh, um, recent survey says that 73% of viewers in Super Bowl ads think that um, these ads are just entertaining, not uh, um, um, ads at all. And sort of there's even CEOs of ad agencies that talk about sort of this balance, right? Peter Kripkovich of, of Kramer Casal says, people have gotten confused between what is entertainment for entertainment's sake and what is actually smart marketing messages. And then John Bond says, the two places to air in a commercial are all entertainment, no selling, or all selling and no entertainment. So they seem to be proposing this balance, but there's no evidence of how do you get the balance? Where, where do you put uh, um, the amount of entertainment in your ads? So uh, the basic conceptual model that I'll use is entertainment leads to interest for the ad and uh, interest in the ad makes it more likely that the ad will be persuasive and entertainment by, might also have an impact directly on purchase. So if people feel in a good mood, they're, they're more likely to uh, uh, want to uh, um, buy the product. So there's these two routes by which um, these things happen. So the experimental approach is the following. I choose three product categories, uh, um, beverage, uh, confectionery, and alcohol. And I choose three random, uh, 30 random brands in these categories. And out of those, I choose 82 ads um, for all of these categories, making sure that for each brand, I chose a series of ads that have different levels of entertainment in the ads. And then I show 20 uh, ads per person from each of these three categories. And what I do is I measure their express level of entertainment through the, the camera. I let them skip out of ads if they don't want to watch it. So I measure interest in the ad, and, and then I ask a later purchase intent questions. So uh, these are, are the, the brands, beverage, confectionery, alcohol. I have 5,000 viewing instances, so 275 participants, a big, very big data set. I measure so many things, demographics, prior familiarity with the brand, purchase consideration, prior uh, uh, um, a purchase intent, purchase frequency, just to make sure the ad is making the impact that it does. And so what, the type of data that I get is something like this. Uh, I show ads to many people, and you can see here the amount of joy that they're feeling.
So you see, right? People are at home and they're watching these ads and they smile or they don't smile. Uh, so this is the type of data I get. Lots of people comply with when I say don't put your hands in your face, but some people don't. So 78% of the data is actually used. Um, the first uh, question, so I'm going to answer them in reverse order. The first question is how much to entertain consumers? So what I find is I measure entertainment for each person for each ad, and then I put all this data together. And so you can think of entertainment as a continuum from zero to one. Uh, and then I measure viewing interest, the probability that the person watches the ad until the end. And I find that, not surprisingly, the more entertaining the ad, the more people are going to watch the ad. Now, for purchase intent, what I find is that entertainment, if you increase entertainment up to a certain point, it increases purchase intent. But too much entertainment in ads, in ads actually reduces purchase intent. So too entertaining ads is actually, not only it stops working, but it's bad. How many of these ads in my randomly chosen 82 ads have too much entertainment? 23% of ads. And that is bad because companies are actually trying to be entertaining. It's not like these are like the worst brands. These are generally the best brands, the ones that are really trying to get the best ads. So that's a problem. Um, um, this is just an example of showing for the same brand how you can see that Pepsi launched a, a, a brand that had 13% of purchase intent and 18% of viewing. Uh, when they had this um, other campaign that had much higher purchase intent, much higher viewing, but this, the first date ad, the, the viewing is even higher, but purchase intent is lower. That's just an example of this effect. So main takeaway, entertainment always improves um, ad interest, but improves purchase intent only up to a certain point. Um, the, the second order is why does this happen? Why does entertainment sometimes have a negative effect. And there's two competing uh, um, um, hypotheses. One is that this is the order of in which entertainment with the brand appears. The other one is that if you put too much entertainment, there's actually less time to put information content. And so I try to tease that out. Basically what I do is I identify where the brand appears in the ad for the first time. I throw away everybody that has seen this ad before, which is 17% of the data. And then I measure how much entertainment comes before the brand appears and how much entertainment comes the after. And I call brand associated entertainment that which comes after. So when I separate these two, um, basically, if I look at the amount of entertainment, the total amount of entertainment used in the ads, I find the inverted U, this kind of um, concave shape for both types of entertainment. So that doesn't explain that just entertainment crowds out information. What I find interesting is that when you compare brand associated entertainment that comes after the ads, the more you put, the better it is for purchase intent. But for entertainment before the brand, the more you put, the worse it is, right? And so uh, um, uh, there's an example here, but I don't have time to show it. But basically, uh, these two ads have the same amount of entertainment, just um, entertainment before or after the brand appears, and the one that has before comes first. Why is that? It turns out that brand associated entertainment cooperates with brand persuasion because of this process of transfer of associations. Entertainment before the brand actually competes with the message that you want to talk about the brand that persuades. And so therefore, this is actually not completely, you should not completely avoid it because entertainment before the brand exposure actually gets people to watch the ad, but it actually reduces the intent to purchase. So I have about one minute left or something like that? Yeah. Okay, so the second point is brand associated entertainment, that one that comes after the brand appears for the first time, improves purchase intent while non-brand association entertainment diminishes it, and that's important. So lastly, uh, why entertain consumers? What I basically find is that there's two routes. Um, entertainment can actually increase people's desire to watch the ad, and entertainment actually has a direct impact on purchase intent, but brand associated entertainment does these two very well. Non-brand associated only does the first one. So if you entertain before the brand appears, it's only to get people to keep watching your ad. So that means that entertainment either attracts attention or, or persuades the consumer to the brand. Uh, so basically, what, how do you consider, what do you consider when, when using entertainment in ads? Basically, if you add ad time, the level of entertainment, more interest in the ad, um, it, um, you can increase interest in the ad indefinitely by putting entertainment. But only up to a certain point you can increase purchase intent, so you have, level, you have to level that out. Relative to where you put the brand, you have to decide if you put entertainment before or after, and it depends on more or less purchase intent and how you trade that off with more interest in watching the ad. And then lastly, where do you put the brand? It depends. If you put the brand too soon, people are more likely to skip your ad because it's not entertaining. You're just trying to brand. But if you put it too late, 
then you don't have the benefit of the brand associated entertainment. So my contention is that these are the three issues to focus as a brand manager. These are strategic issues to get the ad to work. Leave for your ad agency what type of creative entertainment to use. Do you use humor? Do you use goofy? Do you use this? Do you have a creative story? Like the ad agency will know how to do that better. Focus on what matters is getting attention and getting persuasion and leave all of the creative content for the advertiser. So um, last slide, um, the key takeaways. If your goal is to entertain, to sell the product, do not use too much entertainment. If, um, also, to sell, if your goal is to sell, and not all ads have a goal to sell. Some ads are just interested in trying to get awareness, and they'll have other mechanisms to try to get people to buy the product later. But if your goal is to sell, uh, um, use most of your entertainment after showing the brand. Be very careful where you place the first image of the brand. That matters a lot. And there's no one solution fits all. And then lastly, if your goal is to increase interest in the ad, then entertain as much as possible, particularly at the beginning of the ad. And that's where Super Bowl ads are actually trying to do. They're trying to create this interest and excitement. They're not trying to get you to go and buy the product. And so uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. If you want the slides, if you want the videos to teach, if you want uh, uh, any other uh, material, please email me. I'll be glad to supply all of this to you. And, and you can watch the other videos, examples, to really understand by exemplification how actually these things are working. Thank you very much.